or the Max family keeps growing and this guy might finally be deserving, at least in size, of that Max title. Welcome to Machines More. So not too long ago, the Encore 100 Max launched. That was number two in Cooler Master's Max lineup, which joined the Enter 200 p Max. Both of those were SF cases, so those were a little bit diametrically opposed to a name like Max. But this one, TD500 Max, it's an ATX case, and now we are getting into, you know, Max territory. So quick disclaimer, Cooler Master provided this case for the review. Big thanks to them, but I'm not paid by them for this review. And you can always expect fair and independently researched content on this channel. So for those of you new to the Max concept, it's a case bundle. So Cooler Master adds a pre-installed power supply, usually pre-installed or pre-routed cables and a cooling solution along with the case. And that makes the build process very quick and simple. The user just has to, you know, decide on the motherboard, CPU, RAM, graphics card, and storage, and that can help make the process beginner friendly. Now, certainly it's not as involved as building it up from all individual components or not as fun, but not everyone necessarily wants that experience either, right? So this is a different product line with a different intent and different purpose. Out of the box is a TD500 V2 that it's based on, but it is a unique color, however. It's kind of like the unique color for the Inner 200 p Max because it's gray, it's kind of stealthy, and it's bundled with a customized 360 millimeter AIO and GX2 850 watt power supply, which is ATX 3.0 compatible. Now this cooler is quite interesting. It is based on the Atmos cooler that I reviewed recently. It also has a neat user customizable pump head that you can kind of 3D print designs for. But the stock Atmos usually has more standard rad thickness at about 27 millimeters. This one is what you might consider a thick rad for an AIO because it's 38 millimeters. And that's similar to what you would find on high performance units like Arctic's Liquid Freezer and Vantex Glacier 1T30. That rat is paired with three of Cooler Master's Mobius 120p fans, which are quite nice, and it is front mounted behind a mesh front panel. The tubing run from that front mounting choice is a little bit more visible compared to a typical top mount because that tube will snake across from the bottom of the front panel to the CPU socket. But the thermals from doing it this way are a bit more streamlined since the CPU cooler can run in intake and that takes in the cooler ambient air without having to pass through GPU exhaust and the included case fan at the back helps exhaust heat from both components out the back and the case will also equalize by air exhausting out of the top. This case is designed to be an easy build and once you prep your motherboard and install the pump head it's just a matter of connecting up the power cables to the board and slotting in your graphics card along with the power cables. Hook up the pump head cables to the board and the RGB to the hub uh, at the back, which is the RGB and fan hub, if you want RGB at your pump head. Um, and you also have a USB-C, USB-A front header, front panel connections and audio cable to hook up. So interestingly, they didn't include one of their single front panel connectors like they have with the Encore 100 Max or the Encore 200 PV2. That would have been much appreciated here. Cabling this case is very simplified since they built in a two-stage connection system here. And instead of having to route cables through the motherboard tray, basically you have a pre-mounted extension cable that has connections to the power supply on the blind set. Those are already connected. And within the main chamber of the case, you just need to route these little short sections to your board and GPU from those connection points. These short sections also feature the textured vinyl that they look pretty similar to other Max products, and this creates pretty easy cable management at the front. One thing though, they did include only one single 8-pin PCA power cable, which is a really odd choice because they do have the 12V HPDR cable, but there's plenty of even current gen AMD GPUs that use two or more 8-pin cables, uh, not to mention anyone carrying over a previous gen card. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, there doesn't appear to be any other port location cut out for that two-stage extension, but I think this would be really easy to implement. So I think it's a little bit of an oversight um, and it's a shame because otherwise, if you aren't using a 12V HP or rear GPU, it's absolutely fine. Of course, the cable there, the 12V HP cable is sleeved in a very noticeable material in contrast 
to the finer detailing on the vinyl extension cable, so some might call it a little bit uh, visually intrusive. The power supply here is the GX2 850 watt. It's not the higher tier GX3, which does incorporate a lot of aesthetic improvements, but you really wouldn't be able to appreciate that here since the power supply is tucked into the bottom chamber of the case. It is still a good and an 80 plus gold unit and at 850 watts I'd feel comfortable running even the 4090 on this and you do already have the 12V HP Dewar cable native to the PSU if your card requires one. You also have ample room at the bottom of the case for 3.5 inch HDDs that will sit right in front of the power supply. Uh, plenty of two and a half inch drive space all along the interior of that cable management area And there's even a little area on the side here with spare screws if you need them to test this out I built in it with a gigabyte MATX B650 board 7900X and 6800 XT here And I really wanted to use this card because I've tested other cases with that card So I have a good idea of how those thermals are but because of the single 8 pin provided I had to grab another 8 pin cable, which fortunately I had because I have a GX3, but it looks kind of clunky because, you know, one cable is coming from the PSU, one's coming from that two stage connector, but, you know, a little bit clunky. Otherwise, it went together very easily, and the intent here by Cooler Master, right, it's, it's designed to take a lot of the guesswork one might have for a first time build, and at the same time, you do still have a scalable template for future builds as well, if the user wants to get the full experience one day uh, for a system rebuild or an upgrade here. CPU thermals are good with the TD500 Max. You can pretty much run any current consumer Intel or AMD CPU with this, you know, 14900K, 7950X, I don't think you'll have any issues. Uh, here the CPU was happily drawing down about 190 watts and boost clocks are pretty decent without any PBO adjustments. Interesting thing to note, if you compare one to one against the NR200 PV2 that we just reviewed, the thermals are actually pretty similar when we lock the clocks at 5.4 gigahertz and 1.25 volts. And one limitation with Ryzen 7000 tends to be the ability to transfer the heat from the CPU's IHS to the CPU pump block. So, you know, you can have all the heat exchange capability in the world, but if your limitations at the block or the cold plate, then, you know. But the 360 Atmos, it does a pretty good job here nonetheless. And the Mobius fans are quite good. I think if you are doing a more typical gaming build, like with a 14600K or Ryzen 5, the advantage you can get from this setup is that you can get away with reduced and quieter fan speeds. For 1440p gaming, the CPU was really, really cool. And you can see we are getting the boost clocks typical for the CPU at stock. And you really could run the CPU fans slower here and still get acceptable thermals. GPU thumbs are good, but they're not great. At least um, in this regard, there's no particular feature here that would boost these temps with this case. Uh, there's no fans at the bottom, right? The source of the intake air is the fans uh, exhaust from the radiator. So the only way this could get a little bit better is if you add fans at the top, which you absolutely can do. You can add three 120s or a, a few 140s if you wanted. Uh, but yeah, other than the PCIe eight pin cable shortage, I like it. It's a good case with some neat little features and very well suited to a developing PC builder. Pricing for this unit is $400 US. So if we do some math, well, if you were to get the components separately, the case only you can find it for about 100 bucks. It does come with two additional fans versus the Max. The exact power supply I had difficulty finding in the retail channels, but figure that the GX3 is about $150. Their NWE Gold is $90, which is a lower end product. So I call it 130 for the bundled 850 watt. Then you have the cooler, a stock Atmos 360 is 150, but these have what I would consider better fans, actually much better fans with the Mobius 120s and they're usually $30 each. Plus you have a thicker radiator. So kitted out this way, it's definitely a higher value than the stock Atmos. If you back into it, you're basically spending 170 or so on this cooler, which I don't think is unreasonable. Um, as a point of comparison though, for 170, you could also get something like Lee and Lee's GA2 Trinity Performance, which I'm testing for review. And this is an incredible top tier cooler and it's gonna be hard to be beat. Um, so based on this, I do think you could do as well and likely a little bit better on value or performance if you were to grab a case only and pick up the power supply and cooler separately, but that's not going to be laid out and pre-installed already. So this really is more geared 
as someone who is prioritizing convenience and it is still a pretty decent package that they've put together. I mean, nothing is stopping you if you wanted to get a TD500 V2 and then, you know, piece it out that way either, right? But if ease and convenience is your goal and you just want to build and play or learn into the process, my opinion is this would be a very good ATX choice here. But the caveat is if you are building in this case, at least until Cooler Master is able to do something about that single eight pin cable, your easier bet is gonna be a 4000 series NVIDIA card because your 4060, 4060 Ti and some 4070s, you'll have a single eight pin. And for some 4070s, you'll have the 12V HPWR, 4080 and 4090, you'll have the 12V HPR. So you will have your bases covered with the 4000 series card here. So if you found this helpful, if so, please give a like, subscribe if you haven't already. I'll leave the links for the case and the components down below. Thanks for watching.